Welcome back to the Charismatic Voice, everyone. I'm so excited today to have Devin Townsend here with us. Uh, thank you so much, Devin, for making You're time so welcome. and joining us. <laughs> You're so welcome. Thank you. Nice to meet you, Elizabeth. You too. Um, obviously, we are a really big fan of you as evidenced by Octopus. <laughs> ah, so good. <laughs> yes. And uh I guess to get it all started, I have the main question. Because this is a tea time interview series, I want to know uh, which one is better, coffee or tea? I think ultimately coffee by a huge, or not coffee, tea by a huge <laughs> margin. But uh, coffee serves a utilitarian purpose for me that, that so I go off and on it. I'll, I'll, I'll drink coffee until it becomes problematic and problematic in that I hit this point where all of a sudden I realized I'm like, oh, this, this is really fucking gross. Like I don't like it actually, <laughs> right? And then, um, and then when it when that happens, there's there's a shift that happens where I go uh, backwards and I, I I go back to tea and I stop drinking coffee for six months. And the answer is tea for sure. But uh, coffee, because of my schedule and because of my lifestyle, has been. Um, uh, helpful to me. And I appreciate it for that. <laughs> now, uh, before I hit the record button, uh, you were t starting to tell me about one of your favorite kinds of tea. Yeah. Uh, okay. So <laughs> um, my favorite tea, uh, when I was a kid, it was, it was Earl Grey for sure, but with milk and sugar, but then this one has been so good for me in terms of, I'm trying to center it there. In terms of working, I got here. I can make it lighter on the screen. Two seconds. So, Ooh. right, uh -huh. yeah. uh -huh. right. There we go. Technology. So, yeah. So that it's like it's, I don't know if it's pronounced gen matcha or gen matcha, but it's basically <laughs> it's a combo of of green tea with uh, with roasted rice, and um, they're about two dollars ninety nine cents for a package of however many this is 20 <laughs> and uh you get it at superstore in vancouver or you can get it at, at uh, asian markets and i buy it in boxes of 15 so i'll get <laughs> so the last time i went to the superstore I, I came out of it with uh 15 boxes of it and that was maybe a month and a half ago and i'm i'm down to six so oh it's time for another another stop maybe maybe <laughs> but it's it's um it's one of those beverages that, although I've been drinking it for a long time, you know, those ones where you drink it and, every, and you still drink it. And when you think it, when you're drinking it, you're like, oh, I love this. Like, mm -hmm. I really love this. I still feel that way about it. I don't, I'm not irritated by it yet. So that's, <laughs> that's my current, that's my current kick. That's awesome. That's awesome. Yeah. That's a, yeah, good indication that it's good tea. And I actually, for Christmas, um, my family got me a kettle that has different settings on it. So you have it for oolong or you have it for black tea or, or, or all this. And my mother and sister, they got me a, a nice little ceramic teapot, like, um, uh, for, you know, Chinese tea. But I find that the, the strainer on it, there's, there's a, a part of me that, that, uh, feels irritated by the effort that has to go into it. So I, I do like how quickly you can just sort of dump it into a, 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 a cup of water and move with this. Right. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Uh, I, I got set up with a very bougie tea maker because I drink a lot of tea. Uh, a very what? I'm sorry. Bougie. <laughs> what does bougie mean? I, I, um, fancy, like, like almost ridiculously like fancy. Yeah. Understood. yeah. Understood. Okay. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, and uh, it was actually another person we had on the channel, Morgan James, had recommended it to me. And and then my husband got it for my birthday. And oh my goodness, it's changed my life. It's so nice. So, so what is it? What What's the difference? Is it is it like, a, is it something that you put loose tea into and then you put it into the cup? Is that the... Kind of. It's it's automated. So it has like a basket that you put the loose leaf tea Dang. into the top. But yeah. then you put like push on the bottom like, oh, this is oolong or what kind of tea it is. And it'll boil the water underneath and then lower the tea basket for the right amount of time into the water and then back up. So you really don't have to do much at all. And That's you have cool. a whole pot of perfectly That's cool. Root. <laughs> it's very fancy. That's cool, actually. I think, you know, I I often fantasize about having 
way more time than I clearly, you know, I think there's a, an element of masochism to my trip. There's gotta be, because my schedule is just always so slammed and, you know, there's this internal dialogue about, Oh God, I'm so busy all the time, but you know, I'm doing it to myself. But I think <laughs> that, uh, there's a part of me that really would like to establish enough time in my life to be able to focus on on making the tea but in the meantime 20 <laughs> bags of this i can just be like bam 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 right yeah works but that's cool what's that thing called is it uh, is it it's a breville tea maker breville BRT the steepinator 9000 <laughs> i mean it should be called that yeah i agree <laughs> they're clearly missing on their marketing there <laughs> yeah totally it's got eyes and arms and it just like screams the whole time yeah, I think it's a friend of mine gave me a, um, uh, it was like a little thing that you hang over the top of your cup and, and, and you put the tea in it and it's got perfor, it's like a, a dude and he's got perforated pants. And so he just sort of, <laughs> he like chills on the side of the cup and then it's, and then it steeps through his pants, which is actually quite revolting, but it's like, uh, yeah, that's, that's cool actually. What's it? Yeah, I'd like to know what that's called, actually, because it sounds like um, it sounds know. cool. Well, it sounds like you have to level up in order to be able to own one. It's like, oh, you're a tea drinker. You're not a real tea drinker until you've got <laughs> the Steepinator Nine Thousand. Right. Well, I will. I will look it up and right. uh, maybe attach it to the video at the bottom so people know Thank about <laughs> the the real name. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, you are from Western Canada. I thought I this am. was really cool because Brittany Slays, who we just interviewed as well, is also from Western Canada. And so what is it about BC in particular, British Columbia, that creates awesome metal artists or at least makes you want to stay there? Uh, I think it's the rain for me. I think, um, and if not uh, the rain in its, it, 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 on its own, there's something about the dynamicism of the uh, seasons that really works for me personally. I, I find that my creative process is very much enhanced by being around nature more so than being around a city. So on two or three different occasions, I moved to Los Angeles and I, I just hated mm. the weather. And it just seems like that's the thing that people like about it. They're like, oh, yeah. I love the weather in Los Angeles. And, I'm, uh, and I hated it. And it was just because it was... I like storms. I like mountains. I like forests. I like the rain, right? And uh, and Western Canada, it's very similar to the Pacific Northwest in a lot of ways, uh, in terms of um, the geology and and uh, it's it's a I don't know the term. I think it's uh, most of uh, Pacific Northwest is temperate rainforest mm -hmm. and. Uh, I don't know. There's a couple of like uh, certain parts of Sweden have a similar kind of vibe, but it's it's uh, I think it's the nature for me and the dynamicism of the weather. That's cool. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's moody, beautiful. I guess, in a sense. Yeah, I know. I really is. I like it when it's just just shitty out, you know, like when it's <laughs> gray and dark and it's just and everybody as soon as the sun comes out, like that's what we got going on now. The sun comes out and then all of a sudden there's humans everywhere. Everybody's out. And they're, you know, talking about the fact that the sun is up in the sky. And I'm just not particularly great at small talk. And so I'm just like, why are we, you know, hey, neighbor. I'm like, oh, here we go. So, <laughs> Yeah. So uh, I, that actually falls in line with another thing that I'd read um, from you saying that you like composing when it's raining. Mm hmm. Yeah. That's cool. I, well, I think it's more insular. And I think that's even why I like the winter as much as, as I do. I really like the mm -hmm. snow. I really like it when it's quiet and it's cold and you're on your own. I, I really dig that. Right. And, but I think a lot of that is just wherever you are, you're raised uh, is going to seep into your DNA. And strangely, the only other place that I really like in terms of geographically is probably where you're at. I really like the desert. Like that's another side of things that I really enjoy. Maybe I'd seen a I'd seen a DVD recently with Captain Beefheart where he had lived in Arizona and he had mentioned that the desert at one time was the bottom of the ocean there. And there's something about that that I, I actually really enjoy as well. So 
It's one or the other. Yeah. It's the problem is it's the extremes, <laughs> right? Uh, it is gorgeous here. Really, really yeah, it is. Gorgeous. I agree. I agree. Yeah. Well, um, let's kind of talk a little bit about your career. For me, one of the things that's just super amazing about you is that you've had a long career. You've released at least 25 albums, I think, at this point. Yeah, and yeah. um, and you've just been going at it a long time with different bands. Um, and you've even found time sometimes to take extended breaks. Do you mm-hmm. have any big tip to give to people about how to sustain that sort of longevity of a career? Mm. I think the I think the biggest thing that comes to my mind is the reason why I've got the career that I have and the ability to be creatively free is because the audience that I have um, managed to, I don't know what the right word would be, attract or, you know, accumulate. Both those things sound more condescending than I mean, but you know what I mean? Like there's people that listen to it and uh, I think in a sense from early on, I established uh, that a part of the appeal for this music is that it's what I want to do as opposed to what I think the audience wants. Mm. And um, anytime that I have tried to make something for the sake of expectation or, or, you know, the audience really likes this one song that I've done, therefore I should make a bunch of songs like that. It just, there's a, there's an element of it being disingenuous that I think the same audience that's so supportive can see very quickly. Mm -hmm. So the workload for me oftentimes is trying to discern how blind I am to my own current scenario. Like if I'm every year, you know, everything happens and you move through it and that process uh, requires a, a degree of self-analysis to say, okay, well, where are you really? Like, not where yeah. do you think you are, but where are you? Like as a human and as, you know, now you're getting older and the kids and and parents and pandemic or whatever it is, it's, these things affect us emotionally in ways that I think I tend to try and uh, defend myself from because it's, it's hard, right? It's heavy. So as <laughs> soon as you're able to put that aside and say, no, dude, you're right here. This is where you are then at that point, the music ends up being effortless to write in a lot of ways. I mean, the articulation of it is always going to be difficult because it's complicated stuff. But when you find that path of least resistance creatively, you're like, oh, there's a ton of stuff here now. And then when it comes out quickly at that point, that's often the time where I'm able to stand back from it and say, okay, I didn't expect that. And I didn't know that it was going to be that, but it clearly is an analogy for that period and as such i think that's what the audience has has come to expect rather than a certain style and so i would say to anybody who's trying to sustain it specifically in 2021 Mm -hmm. um i think people are a lot less gullible than we have been told that that they are right like there's this sense that oh you can trick people into selling them loads of stuff and monetizing everything and and like, no one's going to know, but I just think everybody really on some level does know, and they just kind of tolerate it rather than, 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 you know, embrace it. And so for, for me, my advice would be you just have to figure out where you're at <clears throat> and cut through your, your, your delusion for that moment. And then, then you're offering something that nobody else can offer. And I think that there's a market for that. I love that so much. Thank you. You're <laughs> Super welcome. inspiring. Yeah, thank um, you. Well, <laughs> you know, kind of talking about uh, the different uh, genres and styles and really one of the things I think is super amazing also about you, not just this longevity, but is the way that you do flip between styles. And this makes me want to ask you a ton of questions about Please, uh, vocal yeah. technique and all of these things. So, okay. Um, let's start with styles and training. I, I've mm-hmm. read essentially that you did some choirs uh, or singing some choirs and that was like the like big formation of your vocal technique. And also yeah. you liked musical theater as a kid too. Mm-hmm. Can yeah, you speak a little do. bit about that and like how you feel like your vocal technique has formed? Sure. Um, well, I come from a, I come from a musical background and a musical family and 
singing was a big part of our of our world christmas time and and you know sort of like traditional irish music and the 70s musicals the andrew lloyd weber stuff and west side oh, yeah. story paint your wagon all that right like these were these were sort of my formative uh, years musically and what i think in hindsight was so inspiring about that is that there were broad strokes of emotion that were easy for a kid to understand like mm. fiddler on the roof mm. it was very easy to see what the people were meant to be expressing emotionally because it was so overt right like they're we are happy yeah. and you're like oh that's what happy sounds like or that's what sad sounds like or that's what despondent sounds like um but i think because uh, as a kid, I was always sort of forced to sing. I ended up resenting it. I, like I didn't want to sing and I still struggle with it. And when I got uh, into high school, we were in uh, an area of Vancouver that was kind of low income. And so mm -hmm. musical theater and choir and things like that were, were not high levels of social commodity for a 14 mm -hmm. year old. And mm -hmm. A lot of times it's like, you know, you want to have jean jackets and muscle cars and ACDC and things like this. And so if you were sensitive, as I clearly was, you 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 learn to suppress that pretty quickly. And so having a choir teacher during that period that was able to sort of identify that those parts of my my trip were worth cultivating, uh, he was very proactive with that. And so when it came to singing, I was I was just like, I don't want to sing. You know, I don't, I'm not into it for whatever reason, but he kept sort of encouraging me to do that. And then the real turning point came with a choir that was put together from kids all over the province and they all came together into what I guess was called honor choir. And yeah. Uh, yeah. And so we ended up singing these religious songs that in churches and things like that, Mm -hmm. with a bunch of singers that were also like very much uh very much uh interested in uh singing like legitimately so there was no sense of uh humiliation or embarrassment it was really like these were the people like I really loved to sing and and there was one moment and I remember the interval too I I was singing a second in a major chord at a very quiet um, in a very quiet part. And it was just so emotionally overwhelming at that point that I remember thinking choral music uh, is really important. And then I started listening to Enya and that became like a really big thing for me, right? Like uh -huh. the album Watermark, it was one of those albums. And I think we've, most of us have gone through that situation where you find um, an album that appeals to you so much that you buy multiple copies of it. I did the same thing with like Jane's Addiction and a bunch of other things. And then um, I started working with Steve Vai mm. and he wanted me to sing. And I remember thinking, cause I'd sent demos out. He's like, I want you to be a singer. And I was like, dude, I don't, I don't sing. I'm not a singer. I'm a guitar player. Yeah. And so I moved to LA and, and, uh, and uh, that experience was very challenging because I was so thrilled and so honored to do it, but it wasn't my music and it wasn't my lyrics. And I find it very challenging to sing with any degree of sophistication or, authenticity if it's not my words it's like it seems mm -hmm. super weird and so again i i started struggling with the vocals and and at that time i started listening to death metal and and you know thrash metal in a teen in my teen years i also liked that as well but it was juxtaposed by musical theater and and new age music and any and all these things and so when i finally started going to like a vocal teacher because other than choir where they essentially said sing from your diaphragm and yeah. and what have you and when i went to a vocal teacher in los angeles and he said okay well sing for me and i did his reaction was well you don't know what you're doing and you're going to lose your voice and you know i was 19 so i was like oh, i don't care you know like <laughs> you, can't, you can't tell me what to do basically mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. because that's tends to be you know my reaction it's like contrary and so the past 30 years of doing this professionally has been um almost a case of having to go in reverse and sort of reverse engineer how i learned to sing which was honestly force of will much more so than technique hmm. mm -hmm. but then i've had to say okay well how do i sustain this because you'll lose your voice and yeah but you know there's lots of singers in my world that that 
or 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 uh, people who are interested in my work who are professional singers, men and women who will come up and ask me questions about it. But then when I hear them sing, I'm I think, well, you know what you're doing clearly. Your vibrato is even. Your uh, your ability to to maintain your voice is there, and that's not where I'm at. Honestly, it's it's always been I just scream until it tastes like blood, and then two days later I'm okay again. And then at that point, a callus forms, and then I can do it for a certain amount of time. It's mm. it's it's not anything I would recommend. But because I've had to do it professionally, I've had to say, okay, well, how do I how do I sustain this? I'm sorry. Touring is I'm, when you're touring and you're doing that night after night after mm-hmm. night. It mm-hmm. is uh, that is just a different beast. I, I know yeah, that beast is. from the opera side more, mm-hmm. and then uh, helping people through that. And uh, I think, like, if you if you really are doing it the wrong way when you're touring, you won't be able to tour anymore. So <laughs> and- it's like you kind of have to figure out how to do it the right way. <laughs> Yeah, I uh I'll let you know when that happens because <laughs> I have basically so I do an hour worth of or 40 minutes worth of vocal warm-ups. Oh, nice. Like every day, right? And um what are those well not like? every day. Well, it's 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 it starts with quietly establishing the highest and lowest note that I can <gasps> sing during a day. And then I go from the lowest note to the highest note in major scales starting with uh uh, la, ha, hey, go, gug, day. And then I do arpeggios, major arpeggios, doing the same um, the same uh, consonants or, or whatever, same words if gug is a word. <laughs> and, um, and then I end with doing like the bubbles, you know, the thing. Mm-hmm. Yep. And uh, um, I've got this little thing called a zanger which i got online and it's essentially it's a hundred bucks it sucks it's like a piece of plastic that you sing into and i think what its purpose is is it provides resistance it's like it's Mm -hmm. like warming up with with the letter f or letter z right like z (laughs) Uh, and so yeah and then at the end i scream right and then the screaming because it's like a lot of the the catalog has resulted in me having that screamy thing that I do, this sort of fry vocal thing, I guess it's called. Yeah. And yeah. so I have to <laughs> kind of keep that in check or else it compromises everything. And so what ends up happening on tour is that first three shows suck, fourth show and the fifth show, I'm like on point, and then it just goes downhill. And then you have to sustain the remaining 30% of your capacity <laughs> for the next six weeks by just throwing your arms up in the air and saying stupid shit. So it's like, <laughs> I, uh, it's i don't know it's it's a but i do i do love the sound of it i just the process i've struggled with since i was a kid and i think it all goes back to just christmas time where they were like you have to sing and having a contrary nature i'm just like no i don't you can't yeah. make me but now i'm a singer so i'm <laughs> like oh, fuck, right? Ugh, like what did yeah. i do yeah but yeah. i think it's good I, I i still think that i still think i've got strangely i i managed to maintain my ability to do it and so now i'm i'm in a very fortunate position where i can kind of learn and so i've been trying half half-heartedly but trying right um i okay i love 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 that you're including uh semi-occluded vocal tract exercises which is the like the like technical term for the the bubbles or singing through the zanger i was going to mm-hmm. show you i have um I, I sing and teach with straws a lot because of some really awesome research. Yep. It's the same thing. Yep. Yeah, I've done and that too. It's awesome. These are the straws that I sing through. So anyhow. Oh, kind of great. Cool. In fact, here, I'll see if I got this. this <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's like um bought online because some friends of mine use it. But it's a hundred bucks for this piece of shit. It's like, so it's <laughs> called a zanger, right? And it's... um. It's basically this little tube. Oh yeah. Yeah, you know, uh-huh. you, 
and you just blow and it just re- provides resistance for i guess your vocal cords and warms it yeah. up in some strange way and it works it's like air it's pressure like that similar. redirects essentially and then like makes like a little pillow yeah i think so and uh-huh. it's it's uh a friend a lady that i sing with named annika who I, i'm sure you've, you've oh yeah you've, she's yeah, amazing she's fantastic uh-huh. so she gave me the technique of you put the straw into a bottle of water and then you <laughs> sing into the straw right so uh-huh yeah, yeah. it's so funny um the, the singing straws, they're like, uh, they have like a specific diameter to sing through, which is really kind of cool. I like, I like that approach, but the, the straw in water, that kind of like really gentle, um, pressure back also is super nice. Yeah. yeah Can really I ask you a question things. then? Because I got to yeah. like, I've got a stream in two weeks and I haven't sang in so long. So I've been trying to warm up again, but I just, I don't love singing. That's the biggest mm-hmm. problem with what I do. It's, it's it's a scream tube, you know, that's mm. like uh, fallible. It's, oh, it's yeah. and so there's the psychological aspects of maintaining one's voice and then doing it live. And then the, the pressure in a lot of ways of, of being um, the focal point and not mm-hmm. on the, not in the sense of, Oh, I feel self-conscious, but more people, have a they'll come into a show whether or not it's me or anybody else with a certain uh, uh idea of what a person's voice does to them right and to not yeah. be able to deliver that consistently is sucks so uh, um yeah so i think a lot of times when i like i was supposed to start practicing for this thing like two days ago and every day i found a reason not to i'm just like oh mm-hmm. you know i gotta gotta look on Twitter, you know, whatever it is, right? Like something stupid, just because Uh I know that I don't want to sing. Right. So how do you, how do you maintain a practice regime? Do you sing when you don't have to? Um, sometimes, but often I won't be singing the things that I'm necessarily preparing, uh, for like a performance. If I'm singing something that I don't have to, um, it's because I probably like singing like something musical theater, honestly. Mm. Um, but, uh, I do, I have like a couple different things that I really go for. One is like scheduling the time out. I have a sacred hour that I schedule that is my time to go with the piano and just sit down usually with a cup of tea and practice. And I feel like that hour for me is very meditative. And so because Mm. it's not just the voice, but it's like my time Mm -hmm. and phrases it a bit differently. But the other thing that I think is really important is that the, um, that you have like a a sort of love relationship that you're in love with your voice, essentially like as, as if it were another person or entity Mm. where I think like, if I don't, um, if I don't give this nurture and attention the same way that I give my husband nurture and attention, like that's going to essentially get out of line. And um, I think that for me, Mm, yeah, treating your voice almost like another, yeah, another person. Oh, that's really interesting. Well, the process uh, for me musically over the past uh, since the beginning has been a process of how do you how do you cultivate uh, self love after mm-hmm. years of um, of being disparaging to yourself and that yeah. that process has been uh, wonderful but very difficult if your internal dialogue for as long as you can remember has been one of of criticism so. Yeah. About five years ago, uh, I started becoming really interested in meditation, and that has helped me dramatically. Because in order to try and do it in in a sense that provides the benefits that I'm looking for, it, it forces you to recognize that that internal dialogue has been so negative for so long, right? Mm-hmm. And I think that applying that to singing is something that up until this conversation I hadn't considered, and I think that's actually very very interesting because in a sense the voice becomes almost like an analogy for the part of you that uh has been protected by your ego maybe on a certain level but also yeah. punished by it right yeah totally yeah that's totally. interesting so much it's anxiety. actually really interesting yeah mm-hmm. and it's it's funny because the anxiety stops you from being able to sing it's it's uh-huh. like it's like that same um that same sort of uh, those opposing forces, you know, the 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 protected sort of inner child and and the part of you that is just you know constantly on amber alert to try and not be hurt, uh, 
is the same thing that that seizes your ability to to project who you are with confidence. Yeah. It needs to come together, does it not? Yeah. Yeah. If you look at the vagus nerve mm. in the way it's like connected to that emotional processing center and then goes down both sides of your vocal folds. And the moment you get a little nervous or anxious about something, essentially the muscles that are on your esophagus and your trachea, both those muscles kind of start to constrict a little bit. And then your voice is like, ah, I can't do it anymore. And then it gets in this vicious loop that, yeah, it's so connected. Well, it's interesting too, because the process to allow that to, to, um, uh, to unite requires a type of surrender that is in opposition to a lot of what we're, we're forced in a lot of ways to participate with in society right now. You know, it's like to be, to sing and to be who you are unashamedly requires, uh, uh, an ability to be okay with being vulnerable. Mm -hmm. And I think that, um, you know, I find that for myself, the things that I say, like if I curse anything, it, it, it's directed and it's, it's root is in something that is um, all part of this dichotomy between who you are and who you are trying to be for the sake of other people. Right. Mm -hmm. But it's it's a it's a it, you know I'm almost fifty now and that process of trying to integrate those two things is essentially what the music is about in a lot of ways like mm -hmm. all of it but I don't know about yourself but I have this uh, ability to intellectualize myself more so than participate in it I'm like oh the reason you do that is because of this 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 and this this childhood thing blah 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 but it's also another defense where you're just like oh you're not actually dealing with it you just think you're <laughs> smart because you can identify it right I, I relate <laughs> totally totally I don't yep. think we're alone either I think that's but I guess I hadn't considered the the implications of how that comes into your singing you know I had a conversation with somebody about singing at some point and they say uh, he was saying how come your vocals are always so quiet in your music? Huh. And I, I'm like, well, it's not that I'm embarrassed. It's just that I don't, I don't like being conspicuous. And the whole, and because I didn't want to be a singer, the whole act of being a singer is, it's you, it's your words. What is coming out of your throat is your identity. And I, and so I'm like, well, I just don't want to be heard. And he's just like, well, it's a. He says, I interpret this as as. It's like a child that's playing hide and seek underneath a blanket in the middle of the room. It's like everybody can already see you. It's not like, you know, who are you <laughs> thinking? You know, it's like, turn it up. But it's it's a leap of faith mm -hmm. that um, that I think all signs point towards ultimately, if if like yourself and and people that I'm sure we we both care for, you're on that road anyway. So maybe that leap of faith is is just another is like the next step right yeah that's cool man this this conversation on singing technique like took a different turn than i expected and it went down this route that i just love so much yeah same it's so thoughtful same great. well but i also <laughs> think that uh, uh, a lot of times when it comes to technique it seems to be arbitrary in a sense it's like because if somebody says oh you're how do you do that? Mm -hmm. I'm like, well, I have, I have no idea. I mean, it's, and so I often say, oh, it's force of will more so than anything else. I mean, I can reference to my grade nine choir teacher saying, sing from your diaphragm, but past that point, uh, anything that I've learned how to do has been force of will. And I think that force of will is a direct result of the objective of the music. The objective of the work has ultimately been to move forward and so each album like the music is of no consequence it's essentially like this is what we learned and here's here's uh here's a document of what the solutions to those problems at that particular time were uh and then maybe because i'm just emotionally so closed off it's the way that i can participate in the growth is that i can make a record and then listen to it and say oh that's where you were Oh, there's oh. where your hangups were. You know, that's, that's lyrically. I saw an, I saw an interview with an artist the other day that I was just so inspired by. It was um, a lady. I, I got to remember her name because I've, I've cited it a couple of times now, Maggie something in the UK, but she had said the only art she feels responsible for is the bad stuff because that's, 
the music that she wasn't able to get out of the way of the spirit in a sense. It's like, so music is your job is to try and an artist, a musician or whatever. It's like, how do you, how do you make yourself uh, clear enough? I guess not clear because that implies certain things that I'm not meaning, but how do you make yourself out of the way enough of the creative mm -hmm. spirit so that you can articulate something that is beyond you rather mm -hmm. than, you know, make it about your trip. And so yeah. a lot of times I'll listen to things I've done in the past. I'm like, oh, the, that, that spirit's in there, but it's wrapped up with my own trip, right? Like whether yeah. or not it was drinking or drugs or, or like whatever it was, it's like, it's the same thing, but it's got this gauze of ego on it. That is like, you know, it's useful for me because then by moving forward, you can say, okay, well, that's, that's what you needed to learn or what have you. But the idea so is like, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, please go ahead. Oh, so essentially like you're talking about making yourself like a really clear conduit of that artistic vision. So you aren't in the way anymore. Yeah, and conduit as well, I think it can be difficult for, for people to accept as a motivation because it implies like a channel, which I, um. I also don't, <laughs> you know, and I and I don't necessarily feel that either because that mm -hmm. because it's not like, you know, like you're channeling something. It's just that there is only what there is. That's it. Right. And it's like, and the more I can you know, my favorite quote that I've heard recently is that making music is a is a display of gratitude rather than uh, anything else, because I think there's this this sense of like the nihilism that goes into it or like the uh, it's like, well, what is life? Life is nothing. It's useless. It's there's meaningless. Right. And that's the problem with intellectualizing for me is I go down that path and then by the end of it, you're like, oh, it doesn't mean anything. But beyond my my limited capacity to be in intellectual which is clearly limited there's an awareness of something that's beyond me and i think that that's yeah. so if music can be a show of gratitude for that which is more than our trip then i think that's awesome right but that's hard right because it's years of like you say negative self-talk you start you know, I remember going to uh, I remember going to a therapist and uh, or hypnotherapist. It was interesting. They're like, "Well, do you have a mantra?" And I was like, "What's a mantra?" And they're they're like, "Well, you know, something you say to yourself all the time." And I was like, "Let me think about it." And I was like, "Oh yeah, I do." It says, "What's your mantra?" I'm like, "I'm a fucking idiot." <laughs> oh, you know? God. And he's and he's like, "No, he, he says that can't be your mantra." And I was like, "Well, you know, you asked." And this is this is you know several decades ago, but still it was it was shocking to me to recognize that that's, that was the truth. And so when I think back to a lot of the records back then, it's not like I regret them because that was the truth for me mm -hmm. back then. Like that's where I was at and that's where I needed to be. Right. Because without learning the lessons that came from that, I'm, it's like, you're never going to move forward. You're never going to get to the point where you're, there was this technique that I had, uh, tried which is very difficult where someone says you look at yourself in the mirror every morning you look in your own eyes and you say i love you and you see if you can but it's like so weird because your eyes like ah oh, god no way you know what i mean like it's <laughs> like that level yeah. of but maybe that's where a lot of the 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 progress will lie for me is just getting over the fact that the singing thing is is who you are more so than you know because it's been a real tenuous relationship with my voice it's like i don't want to sing man yeah. I don't want to sing, you know, man, I, that I did the, I love you. Look at your eyes in the mirror thing. Um, when I was, uh, sort of like struggling my way out of depression at one point, um, mm -hmm. which I'd, I'd read that you've experienced as well. And, oh my gosh, that was tough. That was oh, really tough. tough to do. Super hard, super hard. Yeah. I feel like super it's hard. very similar to recording your voice and like learning getting to the point where you say, oh, I love what that sound was. It, it, it's a very similar experience to me, like learning how to love yourself and respect yourself mm. is hard. Well, <laughs> I think I think the, the solution that I found for that vocally is I became really um, militant about recording. So mm -hmm. when I was recording, I was molding my voice to a vision of what I saw myself as in the music, yeah. right? And so, that, but it, you know, I... <laughs> fastest way out is through like they say so it works for me i was like okay i'll put four of my voices on there and i'll tune them and i'll pitch you know i'll make it like like dead on and 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 all that 
But then the problem is, is you go out and play live. And then when you don't sound like that, your, your self-consciousness is, is, well, I'm, you know, it's, it's the same thing, I guess, with Photoshop or anything like that, right? Where, where if you're, um, if you're protecting yourself, what was the other thing I heard the other day? It's like, if you never lie and never have to remember anything, I thought that was great, but oh, yeah. Yeah, because then it's like if somebody calls you out on something, if you you don't have to remember what you had said, you're just like, oh, well, it's this, right? But the process with that for recording and, and vocals is really difficult for me because I've created, you know, I've established an identity for myself that's unsustainable as a singer. Like all, all the screaming stuff, I mean, I, I like it and I can do it, but as I get older, I just don't want to do it as much. And mm -hmm. But people are like, oh, do that thing where you, you do that really, you know, loud, screamy thing. And I'm like, the high fry man. scream. Yeah. 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 And I mean, yeah. I can do it, but it, it sucks. It's like not fun to do. Right. Huh. So uh -huh. you get to that point where, okay, well now I've got this identity as being this guy that does that. How much of that is actually me? How much of that is me just trying to portray something right yeah. but um so i started another record in a month and and uh Ooh, and more. my hope <laughs> well i just finished a project uh that is not song oriented it's this thing called the puzzle that has it's crazy but it was meant to be i need to get certain aspects of the emotional baggage that this year has sort of um instilled in in most of us I had yeah. to get it out of the way because when I went to write songs, I want to write something that's like emotive and romantic and heavy and direct, but that mm -hmm. wasn't what was coming out. What was coming out was just chaos. And I'm thinking, well, it's because <laughs> of this year, right? It's like yep. this year is chaos. So I just did this multimedia project called the puzzle that has two albums and films and graphic novels and it's chaos and it's 60 musicians, but it's chaos. And I needed to do it so I could, get to this right and so the next record i uh, uh i'm hoping that i can discover my voice like because i don't know what my voice is i really don't i know that i've mm -hmm. got the capacity to do a bunch of things but how much of that is actually me is it more soft is it more musical theater is it not singing is it bass is it like i don't know but i think that the answer to that is hand in hand with the self-discovery that I think is important as a human, right? I really think so. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's it's so interesting. Um, you were talking some about this year and I have honestly the list of questions that I have over here, I, the conversation we've had has been so, so much more interesting than any question I thought of ahead of time, but I wanted to ask about, sure. um, the different ways that this year's affected you definitely like the quarantine concerts have been amazing. That's how I, um, that's how I, I, well, it's how we got the octopus. Um, ah, <laughs> that's amazing. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so that was when I was, uh, watching live because I'm a really, I like Disney a lot, a lot. Yeah, same. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so the, the subscribers on our channel had essentially said, Oh, you made a Disney song, but it's, it's yeah, kind of got that twist and I'm into sure. Dungeons and Dragons fantasy at the same time. So you put all that together. Sure, sure, sure. Yeah. <laughs> it was just brilliant. And in the middle Thank of you. it, you were singing to your octopus. And, <laughs> um, and I stopped and I yelled, I need an octopus. <laughs> it's the same one. You got the same one. Kirk, my husband, literally, he ordered it like at that moment when he saw me do that. <laughs> and it showed up two days later and I didn't know it was happening. Amazing. That's amazing. So, well, I got it in Anaheim because we were at the NAM show and it was in oh, the yeah. Yeah, yeah. It was at the lobby of the Hilton there. There was the that <laughs> octopus, right? And uh it, you know, he's awesome. And it's I mean, I love octopi. I think it's they're yeah. just so cool. 
It was so cool. Yeah. When I was a kid, I used to draw pictures of this massive octopi that would just like be holding people in each one of his tentacles. And it was like this, <laughs> but it wasn't like a malevolent thing. It was almost like these like, like immense hugs, but not even because there was a part <laughs> that's like he hugs you, then you die. I don't know. It was like, there's somewhere oh. between the two. Well, it was all yeah, right though, because if you're going to, if you're going <laughs> to go out, I mean, that's, that's a great way to go. Right. Like yeah, octopi <laughs> hugs. So I uh, will just, so you know, if people ask about Krakina, Krakino, these things, um, that is in reference to him. His name is Kraken or Krakino when it's in uh, He has become our channel mascot just because of you and that sorry. video. That's so. cool. Mine was a uh, contentical. <laughs> oh, okay. Perfect. I wanted to know if you have yeah. names. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. Do you have yeah. any other stuffed animals and, and names? Oh, yeah. Uh, well, a friend of mine bought me that the other day which i think is a stuffed penis which doesn't have a name <laughs> but, what's its uh, name pierre i think it was pierre so i okay, think got it. yeah yeah that where was it Can you see him there yeah yeah so yeah. uh but i mean uh i you know what it's like it's uh when on our last run in in america the one that got canceled hmm. um uh, i asked people to bring stuffed animals to the shows <laughs> and so by the end we had uh maybe 15 garbage bags full of stuffed animals that we would put on the stage but because we had to leave we were in nashville and we had to go home somewhere in nashville right now we have a storage space that we're renting that has 50 <gasps> bags of stuffed animals and a bunch of guitars like still <laughs> like we're still paying for the uh, storage space right so but that was awesome and i i don't know i think it's great because i think uh um uh as much as I, I like the things that I like and and there's a certain amount of aggression that goes into what I do or assertiveness or whatever it is. Uh, I like stuffed animals. I think they're funny. I think they're great. I like soft things. I like, uh, I'm aware enough of my uh, hypersensitive nature, but also what it takes to sort of keep that functional for me because touring with that nature is really weird, right? Because mm. it's so much mm -hmm. energy from people. Yeah. But in order to accept that and not be flippant about it, but also keep yourself from either having it go to your head or, or like level you when it comes to criticisms or, or what have you requires like this fine balance. And, uh, but again, I think like just having all those animals on stage, it's like some metal bands that I had toured with at some point, like some real heavy bands. I remember saying this the other day, the singer <laughs> came up to me and he's just like, I like your music, but I, uh, I think that the stuffed animal thing is really weird. And I'm like, well, I don't know what to tell you, man. That's why you don't have them on stage. So, <laughs> <laughs> Right. That's, yeah. that's amazing. That's so funny. I used to think that yeah. they protected me from monsters at night. And so my bed as a kid, I had all of my stuffed animals lined along the edges so that gremlins couldn't get me at night. And uh, they didn't. So it yeah, worked. Nice work. Yeah. It's amazing. <laughs> Good job. Yeah. I, uh, uh I think for me, it was a movie, Dark Crystal, when I was a kid. I loved it so much. And so I like, I, you know, I got into puppets and all these sorts of things. But it's it's funny because I think it's one thing to to have interests is another thing for those interests to define you. For example, like uh, throughout my career and just as a dude, like uh, I've always thought farts were funny or burps <laughs> were funny or things like this. And uh and there's been like a certain <laughs> faction of the audience that thinks it's like a fetish or something. It's like, oh, you and I'm just like, no, dude, it's I I like it because again, the juxtaposition between how clever humans consider themselves to be, yet just how like just these farting, shitting, reproducing apes, you know, mm -hmm. and there's something about that <laughs> that I just think is like, I love that. I think it's hilarious that there's this. It's like for all these brilliant forward thinking thoughts and all these things, it's, it's, we're still gross. And I, so right. I, I think it's, I think it's funny. And, and then with the stuffed animals, it's just more like, um, it's, I mean, they're, they're cool. They're like, I love that octopus. I think he's great. And so I've got one too. You know what? Someone got me the other day too. I wish I had it out here. Um, uh, Cause I had posted online. There was this stuffed, uh, I forget what the names are there. Those, trilobites or something they live under the ocean they're like they're the oldest living organisms they're like uh you know uh um, yeah 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 but there's these gray ones that you can get in japan that are like these big stuffed 
versions Ooh. of these. Oh yeah. And so Did you get one? Yeah. I went to a lady <laughs> came uh, in Singapore and and gave and I love it. I don't have a name for him though because he looks like uh or it looks like it is probably you know it probably wouldn't be bothered either way. It's got a <laughs> it's it's got a sense about it. <laughs> oh, that's cute. That's fun. Yeah. I like that. Uh, I have a few a few other questions here. I want to ask about uh, sort of along the lines of stuffed animals um, and games in. and you know being kids. Uh, totally. In. I love that you're using a video game controller. <laughs> yeah. Um, in uh, in some of the quarantine videos, uh, do you play video games? Never. My son Never. does. No, oh, I don't. Oh, yeah, um, no, right. I'm yeah, I'm terrible with it. And not only that. Well, my reason is, okay, so here's how I feel about video games. I think they're gorgeous, but they're too hard. And at the end of the day, I just don't <laughs> want to put any effort into it. It seems like it's, you know, like I went to my brother-in-law's house a couple of years back. He's like, oh, here's how you get the scope. And then we have to do this and you do a flip thing. And I'm just like, wow, this seems like so much work. Like, I don't care. And at the end, it's he's like, look, you got a golden chalice. I'm like, but I didn't. It's like a video thing. I didn't get it. It's like... <laughs> I hate this. And then on the other hand, like video games have often got like, I hate horror movies. I hate horror movies. Like, yeah. like they affect me super negatively. I hate that shit. So it's like, and a lot of these video games are just gross. They're just brutal. And I'm like, I don't, why do I, you know, like, uh, <laughs> and so my son plays video games. Like that's what he does. He's a, He's a 14 year old in 2021, right? Like that's yeah. what happens. Yeah. But <laughs> I've said this before, but the only video game I've really enjoyed ever, other than when I was a kid and I like Pac-Man, was um <laughs> this game called Burnout. Because what you do is you hold a button and you go 200 miles an hour and things explode and it tells you you're awesome. It's like and it, it takes no <laughs> effort. And I was just like, oh, I could deal with that, right? Like that's all right. But again, I never, no, I don't, I don't, I don't play video games at all. They just make but great I, controllers for shifting cameras. Yeah. My, and my son was pissed because I had to borrow it from him. <laughs> you know what I mean? Oh, <laughs> I think, no. uh, yeah. Necessity being the mother of, of invention and all that. It's like, okay, so there's this program that you could attach to OBS uh, called mm -hmm. controller mate, where you could assign external things to do the hotkeys within OBS. Oh. Yeah. So, and so you could do it. Uh, at first I did it like I had to go USB out, but then I found that you could also do a wireless uh -huh. thing. And then you just basically go in and then when you hit X, you can then assign it to A and you hit Y and you can assign it to C and then you go into OBS and you're like, okay, so C is camera one and X is camera two. And it worked all right. But then by it's the end, cool. it, it worked good. But then by the end, I found you could send a MIDI over your network wirelessly to your OBS computer and then run a MIDI track from your session that's doing all these things and have the cameras automatically change with your click. Whoa. But in, yeah, but it was cool. But at the end of it, it almost seemed like it was less endearing because it didn't have that sort of MacGyver-ish sort of vibe to it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I get that. I get that. Yeah. <laughs> that was fun. Um, well, let's see. I, I want to know what your favorite venue is that you've ever sung in. Do you have a favorite? Probably the shower. Oh, but yeah. Even then, yeah. <laughs> shower even singers then, unite. <laughs> yeah, right? Uh, but even then, it's like, um, it all depends on how good my voice is. Because some nights, and it's so unpredictable, some nights I'm like, oh, I'm on point tonight. I have no mm -hmm. idea how that happened. And then other days, you're in this gorgeous venue and you suck. And oh. that that actually underlines how how much I dislike the experience. It, it like yeah. makes it, it, it like takes that humiliation and just ramps it up. It's like, not only do you suck, but you suck here. You know what <laughs> I mean? It's like, so I don't have a favorite venue, I guess would be the the long answer. Do you prefer uh, the home streaming for performing, like just personally over being in a big concert hall since there's less things that are out of your control? <sighs> Performance for me is is for the audience because I love my job so much, but I'd be mm. fine to not perform. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's it doesn't matter. It's going to be as weird depending on whether or not it's in the corner of your room or if it's in a big venue, right? Mm 
Like some, but it's like anything, you know, there's, there's peaks and valleys. Some nights I've, I've really enjoyed performing and, and the parameters that makes it enjoyable. I, I think it's, it's, it's a combination of, of circumstance, right? Mm -hmm. That's so interesting that like all of this is leading directly into one of the questions I love asking, which is what do you think the best and worst thing about your profession is? And I feel like you've answered that some, but if you were to sort of narrow or summarize it, what would you say? I would say the best thing is the growth that can occur on a personal level by being thrust into situations that you wouldn't choose. I think, you know, mm -hmm. like left to my own devices, I don't, I doubt I would want to spend much time with people or, or travel many places or, or do much. Right. Uh, but my job has forced me to not only do that, but also interact, which as somebody who's not a huge degree of social anxiety, but a certain degree of it, it forces you to contend with that. And that's where a lot of the, the growth comes. And my objective is to try and um, not fix myself, but it's something like that, you know, like, like to try and reverse engineer the trauma or the, or whatever that happens just as a result of being a human being. So mm -hmm. that has been great. And I think the, the worst part about it is the first thing that comes to mind is monetizing it because there's a certain degree of it's gauche, right? To take something that's rooted in in personal expression and 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 ultimately trying to get out of your way enough, like we had spoken of earlier, to represent something that's beyond you and then put a price tag on it. It seems like disgusting. But at the same time, family, kids, it's in order to facilitate my work, I like to be able to have, you know, the tools that I need, which all cost money. So, mm -hmm. so I think it's, it's like anything else. It's, it's, it's balancing that, right? Like balancing that um, juxtaposition. It's, it's simple as that. Maybe that's what it all is, right? Everything's a bit of this and a bit of that, and just trying to be okay with a little bit of each. Yes. <laughs> yes. Um, and I just personally really wanted to know, um, you, let's see, Tracy, right? Is your wife's name? Yeah. And I'd read that you started dating Tracy at 19 and you guys have a son now as well, right? Correct. Right? Yeah. Rainer. Mm -hmm. Is that right? It okay. is. Um, how, how do you balance, especially touring with family and, uh, that life balance overall? How do you keep that in line? Like, how do you make sure that they get the time and attention that they deserve? I mean, if the implication is that I do it well, then uh, I think that might be um, that might be uh, a little give me a bit a bit of credit. I think I do it okay, though. Uh, I think it's all about managing your yourself. I think really that's what it comes down to, and perhaps that's how the music has evolved in the way that it has is, is the situations that I found myself in life by my own hand have resulted in problems that need to be solved. Like that's, and that's an example of one. Mm. How do you, how do you take care of a family when you are um, in the midst of this craziness? Yeah. But I think that you, you have to, you have to give them credit too. Mm -hmm. And you have to be able to manage your reactions to the stimulus that come from this job in ways that keep you balanced. And there's a lot of things, you know, you try and be moderate, like you have a glass of wine or whatever. And that's it's one thing. But at the same time, it's very easy for these things to sneak up on you. And before you know it, you're unbalanced. And then when you're unbalanced, all of a sudden you're writing music based from a headspace of being unbalanced. And, and I think that managing your expectations is part of that management as well. Like uh -huh. uh, part of the process of, of learning to accept ourselves is also accepting our limitations, right? I think that a lot of what we're sold in society right now is that we all have to be um, in shape, billionaires, uh, you know, uh, perfect Instagram 
human beings, all this sort of stuff. And at the end of it, we're like not. And so there's to be able to say, okay, I'm not that helps too. Because then on some level you can say, I can only do what I can given the tool set that I have. But that also includes not becoming like, um, you know, losing your discrepancy as to what you are capable of versus what your your limitations are. And so you just have to do your best, right? And and when you make a mistake, you just got to try and like learn from it. And when you make it again, which I clearly keep doing, um, and not like don't beat myself up as much as I perhaps am want to do and try and drink some tea. Yeah, like, I mean, really, <laughs> I think if, I think if I think if we go into these things thinking that we're um, we're perfect, I think there's a real problem with that. You know, that we're perfect singers, we're perfect people, we're we're not. You know, it's like I'm not. I mean, clearly. So the recognition of that has been really, um, really good for me. I guess <laughs> that that was a really awesome answer. Thank you. You're uh, welcome. I have a bunch of patron questions. So okay. um, yeah. I, they are really, really big fans of you. I mean, obviously, but uh, so a rapid fire on a few of these here. Yeah, so, of course. Yeah. Austin asked, would you ever consider resuming ZTV? <laughs> Maybe. I think like we had spoken of earlier in the interview to do what I'm, uh, what I feel, um, like is is a compulsion to do what I feel uh, is the best way for me to make something that is that has any degree of emotional authenticity. So if I feel like it's time to do ZTV, that's all I'll feel like doing. <laughs> and currently I don't, but that's not to say that it won't. Awesome. Uh, and Zachary wanted to know what is the title of the morally. <laughs> Oh, that's question. <laughs> Sorry, I just remembered this question. I wrote it. What is the title? Oh, goodness. <laughs> what is the title of the morally imperative duet between Heavy Devi and Elizabeth? Also, how do you pull off symphonic bagpipes so well in it? <laughs> well, I think it's recognition of the fact that everybody is lost. And so if you're fighting the same battle, why not use bagpipes? <laughs> There we go. Yeah. Bagpipes. Truly. <laughs> um, and <laughs> Rue asked, I know, right? That's awesome. Rue asked, what does your kiddo think of Ziltoid? It doesn't. I think, I think a lot of that is just, you know, when I was a kid, uh, I remember thinking that uh, whatever my dad did, was of zero interest to me. And I think that when I was younger, I would think, oh, okay, well, one day I'll be a musician. And clearly if I have kids, they'll be interested in it, but it, it's got nothing to do with the music. It's just, <laughs> it's just in order for kids to thrive, they've got to rebel against their parents. And a lot of that is just like, I don't care about what you're doing. Or and I think that's games. probably, yeah, I don't care what he's doing either. That's my reaction to it. It's like, you don't care about Ziltard? All right, well, I don't care about that either. <laughs> That's funny. Now, uh, Rob B asked, which venue did you find more impactful for your per for you personally, the Royal Albert Hall or Plovdiv? Did I say that right? Yeah, um, probably the Royal Albert Hall, just because Plovdiv came uh, in the middle of a tour, and it was just at that point the workload was just so extensive that mm. it was much more of a um a utilitarian mindset to make that work it's like okay what do we need to do to pull this off we've got the orchestra we've got the choir we got all these things and as grandiose as it is like on film and, and for me as an artist the practicalities of doing that when we were already really fatigued was you know i was just like you just take a deep breath and dig through it as opposed to the royal albert where i was you know a little marginally uh but less uh busy right mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah that was a good show Uh, 
Uh, Luke Thurman asked, what is your opinion of music reaction channels like the charismatic voice? And how do you as an artist think that they impact the music industry? It's hard for me to, to answer too much because I haven't watched enough of them to, to have formulated an, an opinion. And, and that's, uh, and that's based on when someone says, oh, here's somebody reacting to a video of you. You know, my first thought is like, oh, I don't want to see that. It's like, and it's not, not to do with the person reacting or anything. It's just like, it's, I'm sure it'd be the same for you. It's kind of like, well, that'd be embarrassing to see like someone talking about you or like, or like giving uh, their impression of, of your performance and all this sort of thing. I think, it's like no 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 I don't want to see that right so <laughs> I I um the goal for the music ultimately is to help in some way and if it helps then I think it's amazing and and I guess that's that's the that's the most I can I can say about it having not participated in it in it too much right that's funny. I, I relate a lot to that because uh, I do have people that have reacted to me with opera singing or something else. And uh, I'll watch, but it does feel like just a little weird, a little oh, uncomfortable. Oh, little. Oh, my God. Right? <laughs> yeah, it's it's like, it's like uh, I'm sorry if I'm too crass, too. I don't mean to. But it's like, it's no, like it's someone's fine. like, hey, we took a video of you on the toilet. And it's like, there's a whole bunch of people watching it. You want to check it out? I'm like, no, man, no. <laughs> you know, not at all, dude. That seems like it would suck. Right. right. So, yeah. so there's that. Right. But I mean, it's, it's not that I feel any negativity towards it. It's just as a human being, I'm just kind of like, Oh, I don't want to see that. It's mm -hmm. like super weird for me for, yeah, you know, and there's, there's a lot of videos of people reacting or there's, there's people that are like dissecting yes. or, or, you know, and, and I find that maybe on a on a certain level as well, uh, when people are, if people explain what I'm doing, it's like I feel like I'm going to forget how to do it. If they're like, they're like, oh, what he's doing there is he's constricting his throat in order to, and, I, and then all of a sudden I'm just like, oh God, now I can't do it. It's like, mm -hmm. if you think about something too much, all of a sudden your process goes away because it's been unconscious up to that point. Like, Sure. I don't sure, know. Sure. But I, again, if it helps people, I think it's awesome because that's what the intention is, right? Yeah. Yeah. And it is like, it's, it's really sweet. That's the other thing I've noticed most, um, most of the time when I've seen something else come up and it's just that. really complimentary. And I think that that's ultimately trying to help people. Well, and this is more. the thing is it's, this is why it's, it's, it's like, I don't want to comment on the, the content because I haven't seen it. And Mm -hmm. As a person, I mean, of course, I find it flattering. Oh, my God. But I said this to a buddy last night because I finished this record and I sent it out to him. And he had he, he said such nice things about it. And I can't take compliments. I hate it. But I'm working on it. Right. So mm -hmm. so he said this really nice thing. and I'm like, oh, I don't know what to do. So and he knew I was online and I was like, I don't know how to react to this. And my buddy who I've known for years is like if you can't take a compliment, what you're essentially doing is you're insulting the person that's giving you a compliment on some, to some degree. It's like, if someone's saying, Hey, I really like what you do. If you say, Oh, I like what you do or whatever, or you're just like, or oh, no, it sucks or whatever. There's, there's, there's like, but hand in hand, probably with my vocal hangups is my inability to take compliments. And so when, when people are, are reacting to something that I've done and have been really complimentary, it feels very much like receiving a compliment from somebody I care for. You know, it's like, I'm not good at it. So, you know what I mean? It's like, I think that's actually even just saying this out loud, how I feel about it. Uh, and if somebody's just like going out of their way to be a, like a moron to you, then I'm just kind of like, whatever. But if somebody's <laughs> whatever, like, toss that. <laughs> yeah, I, I made yeah. a video tell people how much I hate you. It's like, well, that's on you, man. But I think uh, when it comes to like the compliments, I kind of feel like it just stops me in my tracks. It sucks. Again, my buddy, it was yesterday. He said something super nice. 
And then I just sent him this text back. It's like, oh, 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 oh. And then I, a couple minutes later, I sent him a thing going, dude, I, I can't take compliments. I'm working on it. Thank you. <laughs> Is what I meant to say. Thank you. Right. And maybe that's what I mean when I, when I see reaction videos that are nice. Thank you. But that's not easy <laughs> for me. You know what I'm saying? Oh, yeah. Wow, that was sweet. <laughs> It's true. Okay, let's see. Um, GL Schmidt asked, what is one piece of advice you would give to a young aspiring musician or artist? The same piece of advice I, I give when I've been asked that in the past, and that is the people who succeed uh, have failed uh, more than those who give up ever tried. And I think it's really important to learn how to fail efficiently because that's the only way you're going to be able to move forward. That's the only way you have to get over it. Someone goes out of their way to make a video telling everybody how much they hate you. It's like, if that's going to stop you in their tracks, then they, they got what they wanted. And I'll tell you what, if someone's going to be an asshole like that, then fuck them. You know, you shouldn't mm -hmm. like, you're not going to get that from me. No way. And I think anybody who's going through this sort of thing, they have to recognize that that's part of any degree of success is recognizing that, not everybody's going to like you. There's going to be people that really don't like what you do. And if you let that get you down and by get you down, what tends to happen is so, say you make a record or you do a performance that is not good, you know, like, uh, and then it goes online and those people that dislike you are there like, you know, angry on an ape and they're trying to say, ah, I told you this guy sucks. Ah. And if you're like, wow, it does suck. And they are right. Oh man, I can't move forward. If that's where it stops you, then you're never going to succeed. What you got to do is be like, yeah, it sucks. And it was embarrassing, but next. Yeah. Yep. That's good advice. That's the truth for me. Yeah. Let's see. Uh, Randall Jones asked, what are your mic choices for picking both your higher powered tenor clean blasts and the up close and personal growls? Well, I've got three microphones around me. So this one here uh, is a company that I've been working with called SE. And uh, oh, I can't, I can't. Let me see if I can bring it in. And I use this one for quiet vocals. It's like, uh, let's see, does this, you see this? Let's see. Yeah, I can see that a little bit. That one there. Uh -huh. It's like a, you know, it's like a tube microphone. It's super sensitive. It's got uh, a, a, like a, a lot of high end and it compresses pretty quickly, but it's good for like the quiet stuff and not for the full range of it. I wish there was a microphone that got it all for me because I use three mics. I use that for the quiet stuff. For the loud stuff, I use an SM7 because mm -hmm. you can scream into it and it doesn't like get ugly it distorts in a musical way oh, but it cool yeah oh it's great so it's like you know if you scream into a tube microphone and you and it it busts up it sounds horrible mm -hmm. but this is essentially it's like an sm58 which they've been using forever as like your 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 stage microphone but it's got a more sensitive high end so you can get a lot of uh, so the heavy vocals, if you look at a lot of like heavy rock albums, they're done with a SM7 and these are 300 bucks or something, but they're great. And then the one that I use for actually the majority of it, I've got on the stand here. It's a, it's a AKG 414. I've been using that for years. It's all gaff taped together here because it's <laughs> like, uh, but that is kind of somewhere between the two, but it's got like a spike for me. My voice has got this frequency inherent in it. That's in and around 3k that because I do so many like these sort of choir things where I'll stack them up, what ends up happening is that frequency ends up building up and building up and building up. And then I have to put like a, a compressor on it. Right. But, um, and that microphone regrettably accentuates the same frequency that sucks <laughs> in my voice, but overall after using microphones of all shape and size for so many years, those three microphones are the ones that I'm currently most happy with. That's cool. Ah, uh, let's see. Uh, Ruben asked, from an outside perspective, it seems as if your dreams in the music industry as a teenager were shattered early on and changed your view a lot. How do you look at the industry now? And how much has social media like your podcast and Twitch changed your relation with your audience? I don't, I wouldn't say it was shattered. 
because I think that that's more dramatic than what it was. I think it was more like I saw what it was. And uh, perhaps there's an idealism that, that happens when you're a kid that is kind of inevitable. And to think that that idealism is like shattered because it wasn't Disneyland like you were expecting is, is you know, it's a bit much. I think it was more like I got to L.A. and I was like, oh, oh, it's an industry. You know? <laughs> and in, 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 in order to in order to make a living at this, you've got to take that into consideration. You also got to protect yourself like uh, emotionally, you know, like spiritually in ways that were the the genesis of where your your creations stem that's something that you need to you need to be proactive about taking care of and it can be compromised mm -hmm. like uh in subtle ways without you recognizing it and i think a lot of times that does happen to people right energetically you end up being compromised because you're not specifically if you're very sensitive uh, it's, I struggled for years. I'm just like, wow, like every situation's overwhelming. Everything's overwhelming. It's like this person's energy is like, ah, uh, you know, and this person, ah, uh, you know? So it's like, well, how do you defend that? And then once you learn techniques, which of course, you know, I think it's HSP where they say highly sensitive people, there's lots of things that you can do to kind of, uh, 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 sort of armor yourself against that. But then the downside of that is after a while you end up becoming, emotionally unavailable in the same ways yeah. that so it's so it wasn't like it got shattered but i was like oh it's this right and then uh the second part of his question what was it about it was about twitch um, and whatever how how do you look at the industry now and how much has social media mm. like podcast and twitch changed your relation with your audience i think because i was fortunate to to work in the industry at the tail end of when like rock stars actually existed uh I was able to see firsthand how some of that stuff was really abhorrent, right? Like mm. people yelling at, at people that were, that didn't, I'm not talking about Steve, but just like people that I met that were like yelling at people if they brought the wrong food or, you know, or, you know, I mean, that sort of, that sort of entitled shit that was like, okay, mm -hmm. to, you could get away with it in the eighties in a way. Then all of a sudden when I saw it, I was right on the cusp of being part of that. And then part of the, the kind of next movement that came along and uh, I was always really much more interested in sort of saying, well, this is actually what it's like. You know, you sort of pull the, the veil back from it and not like, like you're some sort of freedom fighter or whatever. It just made it easier for me to function if there wasn't that expectation, mm -hmm. right? Like um, by doing a certain type of public work, I'm sure that people throughout the industry find that there's a demographic that want to assume that whoever's public are fundamentally more talented or better or more intelligent or whatever. And it's not the case. I mean, you experience that comes from this allows you to have a certain perspective on it that can be interpreted as that, but it's not like you're fundamentally better people than your audience. It's like absurd to think that. So social media has helped in the sense that by having the ability to sort of be who you are, with the ups and downs of it, like you say stupid mm -hmm. things and blabbermouth puts it up and, but you said it, it's like, it's stupid. So there's a certain degree of accountability that comes with that. Mm -hmm. And um, for the most part, I think my life has, uh, has been, you know, it's had its ups and downs, but, and I've done a lot of stupid things, but I don't think any of it has been so irreparable that, uh, you know, it's going to be problematic. But, you know, I think that having social media allows me to be a bit more like if that objective to sort of pull it back a little bit is okay. truly what it is. I mean, social media will give you that platform because people are like, yeah, that guy is this clearly. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, Instagram is is I mean, if there's ever any question about how much of a jackass I am, it's like <laughs> Instagram is the one. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Instagram's fun. Sometimes, <laughs> sometimes. Right. Uh, quirky Uncle Dave asks, <laughs> you mentioned that Ravi Shankar was one of your favorite musicians. Have you ever toyed with learning sitar or other guitar adjacent string yeah. instruments, either for fun or as a new challenge? Yes. That sounds like a big yes. Yeah. So I went to India maybe two or three years back. No, maybe two years. 
two years back a year i don't remember two years <laughs> and i spent a couple of weeks there and 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 uh went to a bunch of places and played a, a couple acoustic shows and everything and you know got so sick i thought i was gonna die you know the whole like had the full meal deal right and um <laughs> and part of it was uh uh a friend of mine who i was staying with there um she uh uh brought a sitar instructor uh over and uh and i had a lesson and i was like wow i i uh I am not a good student with this. You have to be like the way that to sit and like, cause my back is always, I'm slouchy. Right. So sort of sit with your leg and even just the sitting, I'm just like, Oh, my back's already sore. And then you put this little <laughs> clip on your finger. And I was like, Oh, it hurts my finger. And then uh, <laughs> you start doing it. And um, so what I ended up doing is right before I left, I went to a music store in Delhi and got myself a tampur, but uh, because that instrument I really enjoy because I love mm. bass so much. Like that's my favorite instrument. And tampur is great because it's a support instrument. It's and um, meditative in the sense where it's just, you know, four notes and it's like you can you can you can tune it so that the intervals are different, but it's essentially just octaves and fifths or a seventh or whatever. And you just do ding 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 ding. And the and the way you you made it, and I love that. I love the tampur, right? And so I think I make I'd make a decent tampur student, but uh, as a lead sitar player, I think the ship <laughs> sailed years ago. <laughs> That's funny. Like that was a fun fun question. Uh, Catella asked. Uh, well, we talked about this a little bit though. What is the story behind Devon's stuffed animal octopus, and what do you think of the charismatic voices, Krakino and Krakina popularity originating mm -hmm. from the Y video during quarantine? I think it's amazing. I um. So you've been to Nam, I'm sure, right? Like the Nam yeah. show. Yeah, that's actually, oh, it, it's oh. intense. <laughs> it is intense. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's like yeah. Somebody described it as like a hundred of your favorite human beings that you never get to see, and then a hundred thousand of the worst people in the world, right? <laughs> and it's like, uh, but it's <laughs> so I was there, and you know, the lobby, the Hilton, and everyone's shit faced, and it was like super brutal. And I remember mm -hmm. thinking, God, this is this is overwhelming. And so when I saw the octopus, it was like a beacon. I was like, I was like, you see, if I can just have that octopus, then, you know, it's, he'll protect me from the gremlins around the, 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 the bed of Nam, if you want to look at it that way. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> I, uh, I remember going to Nam the very first time I went there, I was looking for a microphone that could handle opera voice. Mm -hmm. And so I'm kind of looking around like everybody's around me and everybody's all in rocker gear or, oh, yeah. or they've got their oh, boots yeah. on. And, and mm -hmm. I was like, well, okay, we're going to let it rip. So I started singing opera at one of the mic booths and the, like the feeling of everyone in the room being like, what, why is opera here? <laughs> and then the flock of people and the guy at the booth were like, yeah, she's singing opera at my, anyhow. Um, I love well, you know, what's interesting is, is I've had the opposite experience. I've been around um, operatic scenes and then done my thing. And they're looking at me like I'm wearing their sweater. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> they're like, it's with this guy. But no, I get it. And so the, the, uh, the, uh, the octopus, I think I used to, I've always loved octopus. He's a really well made octopus. He looks super cool. And, uh, Maybe it's maybe maybe we have been assigned these octopi. <laughs> I like yeah. to think about it like that. That's good. Same. Yeah. Totally. I'm going to have to get going in about five minutes if that's cool. That's totally fine. Actually, that was yeah. the last uh, patron question I had. So right now to wrap things up, tell me where people can find your music, uh, how we can support you more. If there's anything you're excited about that's being released soon, where can we buy it? All of the good stuff. No, I think it's on probably devontownsend.com, <laughs> but you don't have to buy it. I mean, I think that's the thing is it's like, I'm it's on YouTube and I've got 30 records and all sorts of stuff and guitars and all these things, but buy yourself something nice instead. Maybe <laughs> that's what you should do. You know, like, Go get yourself an octopus. Like, uh, 
listen to my thing on YouTube and go get yourself an octopus. You can get it at the, you can get it. Uh, I think it was from the Anaheim zoo. Oh. Like that's where, that's where that octopus you've got the same one as my, I think it, I think it generated or it, it started at the Anaheim zoo. So I think Devin has got a bunch of stuff on there. And cool. if you have some extra cash, like, I would like to encourage everyone who supports you and has been kind enough to support me to see if they can find themselves an octopus. <laughs> I love that. I love that. And, uh, and we are going to be going to bloodstock um, in August. Hopefully, you know, we'll see how things are, will Same, uh, yeah. come out to play in 2021, yep. Yep. but uh, we currently have plans to go to bloodstock. So hopefully so do we'll I. see you there. So do I. We'll see. Uh, We'll see how that works out. I'm hoping it does, right? Yeah. Oh, well. <laughs> well. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. You're for so being, welcome. Um, for giving us time today and for a of really, course. really wonderful conversation. Um, thank you for the and tea and good luck with your channel too. <laughs> thank you. You're I so welcome. I appreciate that. Yeah. And we'll see you guys all soon. We'll be there. Yep. <laughs> Say hey to Kirk for me again and thanks for setting it up and I'll talk to you soon. Will do. Sounds Cheers. good. Bye-bye. Okay.